consistency. How important is being consistent in your marketing strategy? Today, I am interviewing a farmer who attributes consistency and persistence to being the reason why she was able to nail down a whole new slew of florist clients to sell her cut flowers to. There's a lot of marketing wisdom today. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Welcome to episode 220 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I'm your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms out in Elmore, Ohio, near Toledo. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers get more confident in building their marketing sales systems so that you can grow a profitable business. How's everyone doing today? A big shout out to all of my regular listeners. Welcome back to the show. And if you're new to the podcast, thanks for checking me out today. Make sure that you subscribe to the show. And I always encourage people to go check out the first 10 episodes because they were designed to be an on-ramp into the marketing lingo and they are still just as timeless as ever. Another great place to learn the marketing lingo is to get onto my email list because when you do, I have a three-month-long weekly email that drops into your inbox that basically walks you through the marketing jungle. I drop my best resources, uh, my podcast episodes that I think are really great, and I kind of teach you the ropes step by step and everything builds on each other. So you can subscribe to that by going to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. Today's podcast is sponsored by my friends from Local Line. Organizing your inventory online doesn't have to be a headache. Have you heard about Local Line's advanced inventory feature? This feature allows you to track inventory by weight or by package, create multiple packages and prices for each product from one master inventory, and specify which packages get shown to which customers. For example, you might want to offer larger packages to wholesale customers and smaller packages to retail customers. Spending time tracking inventory can be confusing, time-consuming, and inefficient. So if managing inventory is getting you down, consider adding advanced inventory to your local line subscription for only $25 a month. For podcast listeners, Local Line is offering a free premium feature, which includes advanced inventory, for a whole year when you sign up using my coupon code. Head to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash local line and use the coupon code MDF2023. Terms and conditions apply. And for more information, you can check out the link in my show notes. Trusted by thousands of farmers and producers in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Europe, and now Australia, Local Line offers farmers the ability to own their customer relationships and grow their businesses on their own terms. And now back to the show. So excited to talk with you guys today. I am in week two of my CSA right now. I'm recording this on Wednesday, June 28th. So I've just started my CSA. Our first week went off without a hitch. So excited about that. And I feel like there's a lot of momentum and energy. I wish that upon your business as well. I have a few lofty goals this year. I'm really trying to grow my online store product line. So not just the CSA, but trying to build the online store as an option, like an a la carte service, as sort of an entryway point into my brand. And maybe some of those people will eventually graduate to CSA membership status. Uh, But that's kind of a, a new focus for me this year. So I've got some heavy goals set for myself. And little by little, I see it coming together. It's exciting. So today, I have a guest on the show. Her name's Bridget. And 
I'm excited to share this interview with her because I'll be honest, when I uh, sat down with her over Zoom, I had all these questions prepared. I had done some research. I looked on her website. And then when we actually started talking during the episode, I uncovered some information that wasn't evident in some of my research. And suddenly the conversation went down a totally different pathway for a while where we dove deep into the topic of how to build sales relationships with florists. And that was super fascinating. I've never had a podcast episode about that before. So I hope you get something out of that conversation. Even if you're not a a florist or a flower farmer, excuse me, uh, I think there's something to learn there from the, the process of how do you cultivate relationships with someone who doesn't know who you are at all and get them to be interested in wanting to buy your stuff. So if you're, especially if you're like a farmer that's trying to maybe grow your restaurant business and you want to connect with chefs, like how do you even start those relationships? How do you warm them up and get them to the point where they want to start buying your stuff? Uh, So I hope you get a lot out of this episode. She has a ton of marketing gems to kind of drop along the way. She's only been doing business for a year. So she's a little bit of a newbie. And I also love that about this interview because I like interviewing farmers from all over the map, people who are experienced and have been doing it a long time. I think they obviously have a lot to share, but we can also learn a lot from people who are still fairly new. And she has some background in sales before she started this business. And so you know, we all have something to teach one another, even if you just get one or two really great nuggets from this episode. I And I know that you will. So let me read her bio and then we'll jump right into the interview. Today's guest is Bridget McMillian from Red Handle Farm in Virginia. Bridget was raised by her grandparents on a farm in Amelia County, Virginia, and lives in sight of the home where her grandfather was born in 1928. She is a board-certified health coach who understands the importance of eating fresh food, getting daily exercise, and the mental health benefits of being in nature. Bridget stepped back from her coaching position in 2022 to focus her energies on revitalizing the family farm with the help of her two adult children and grandson, who also live, work, and play on the land with her. She and her family strive to continue the legacy of this multi-generational farm, by producing cut flowers, field-grown fruits and veggies, and forest products. Please join me in welcoming Bridget to the show. Well, Bridget, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm quite excited to be here today. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Yeah, let's get started by just having you give an overview of your farm business and how you joined the operation. Well, I won't say I joined it as much as I was just sort of born <laughs> into <enough>. it. But <laughs> this is this is a family farm. It has been in the family actually since 1917. My uh, grandparents raised me and built a house here. So I've been living um, in this location. Uh, we moved in when I was in the second grade, actually. Um, when I was growing up, my grandpa mostly did uh, cattle and things like that. And um after I moved, I uh, lived around the Roanoke, Virginia area for about 10 years and came back to our hometown. And then after um, my grandparents passed away, I moved here. And, you know, like many other people, I kind of just lived here. I had other jobs and, you know, and a few years ago, I just really, I think, you know, you get a little older, you get a little wiser and it really just hit me the importance and the history of this land and really putting our efforts into doing something, um, whether to make Papa proud or not, but, uh, you know, just to make sure hey, we kept it going, keeping that farm and heritage and legacy going. All right. So for people who are listening, they, they've only heard that your bio read at this point. Um, so can you help people understand like, what is, your product that you sell, um, your acreage, yeah. your marketing outlets, and all of that. All right. So in general, we have a, a large property. The majority of it is forested. So um, we really work on the forestry side of it. But as a cash crop, um, we are doing a lot of cut flowers. 
And um, we're also moving more into certain fruits and vegetables and especially trying to focus on blueberries. Okay. And what are your marketing outlets? Where are you actually selling that? How are you selling it? Um, I mostly use local line. I absolutely love it. I switched to them at the end of last year and I can't speak highly enough for local line. (laughs) So are you take, is this like a delivery thing? Are you taking it to the farmer's market? Are you, you're not shipping flowers, obviously. Um, no, I'm not shipping flowers. I think when I started, it was more of a, not what I want to do, but what I don't want to do. And one of the mm-hmm. things I did not want to do was farmer's markets. I um, did not want to um, be open to the public, you know, like, because the, the farm is our home. And I didn't want people just to come in and strangers I didn't know and things like that. So out of the gate, as far as the flowers went, we were really focused on florist only. So last year, I only sold the florist. And um, to do that, it was really a challenge to get them to pre-order or order online. So honestly, what I was doing each week, um, Monday, I would do a really what we'd call a hard cut. And I would spend most of Monday stripping and bunching and grading the flowers. Tuesday, I would load up everything I could into um, our vehicle. And I had a route of six floors and I went every week. Um, It was time consuming and it was hard. Um, And you never knew. It was almost like I was doing a farmer's market in a flower truck, you know, so I'm still putting in that type of work. So we really wanted to push a switch, push to make the switch this year to have pre-orders and, you know, cut to order. So that's really what we've been working on. And then, um, honestly, another thing I found last year was just, um, I had an influx of the learning curve as you go, but I definitely had an influx of summer flowers and the demand is definitely on spring and fall. So um, we really pushed this year to have a lot more spring flowers and to be able to hit Mother's Day. And with that came the retail sales this year. So we are, are selling retail this year. And um, what we've done to still kind of alleviate what I said with having people come to the farm with local line. They just order. I've got a couple um, businesses in the local area that will allow us to do pickup there so they can choose a pickup location and I will drop the flowers at the location and they can pick them up. So, okay. So you're not actually there. It's not like a staffed pickup site. They don't meet you. <clears throat> so they have a mm-hmm. window of time to show up. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I want to really back up to the the florist conversation because I don't think I've sure. ever interviewed a business who's um, grown fl- cut flowers uh, primarily for a florist, and I did not even know that that's like the workflow. Is that pretty typical when you first get into it that you have to pound the pavement every <laughs> yeah. week? Kind of, you're going to the <laughs> to the different floors and saying, "I hope you want some of this," or um, is that, is that how yeah, that works? I mean, yeah, one of the, actually, um, one of the things you'd ask is like, if I had a, um, a, an aha moment, but it's really, I started out, it's consistency, you know, you're new, they're used to buying from big wholesalers, you know, maybe they don't have a lot of, what do they know about your flowers? You know, why are they going to switch to me? So it's that relationship building. It was the consistency. I went the same time same day, every week, all season. And, you know, that built that relationship. And even if they didn't buy, you know, they're getting flowers in their face, they're getting to learn my quality, how, you know, how we cut what I have to offer. And, you know, it has really, it has worked. So um, again, I I miss seeing them. I miss seeing the floors because I said, I'm not running to them consistently each week this year. It's um, more on, on a cut cut by order, but I'm making just as much. So, you know, I will say that legwork I put into it was worth it. Yeah. What you're describing is the work that I typically associate with, you know, a salesperson who's trying to build a territory and we're going to like, we're going to go off now on some different questions (laughs) than what I prepared. Cause I didn't realize that this was such a big part of what you were doing when I was researching your farm. Um, 
And I think this is really fascinating and some people can kind of learn from you. What are some of the, so first of all, you said that you, you were consistent. Were there times mm-hmm. in the early on in the journey <clears throat> of kind of developing this territory where you would show up and they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy from you like week oh, after we- week after week, like how long did yes. that go on? <laughs> Yes. I mean, I'll say like that I had like six floors that could make a route and, and do, and I had one florist in particular, I went in every week and I had got to the point, but near the end of the season, I could just see it when I walked in every day, he'd almost get this look on his face, like, oh my gosh, she's back. And then, but you know, he would be like, oh, they're pretty. And I'd be like, see you next week. And then towards the end of the season, I walked in with, uh, when it, I don't remember what I had to be honest with you. And he was like, oh, oh, I have to have those. And I'm like, great. And they bought for me every single week after that until I ran out of flowers, until the end of the growing season, until we were out of flowers and, and put in a fairly large order every week. And, you know, it's just, Wow. That's yeah. So what's going on inside of your mind? Uh, because most people I think would give up. Most people would be like, and they're going to say no again. I'm starting to feel like I'm, you know, in their face all the time. Like, how did you just continue to persevere? Well, I mean, I, I guess there's a lot to it. First, I believe in my flowers. I yeah. believe they're pretty. I believe that they are fresh and they're going to last longer than what they're buying. And you know, the flowers, they're not going to sell themselves. They're not. I mean, I can look at them all day and cut them, but they're not going to sell themselves. You have to get them in front of people. So, and again, like I just went into last season and I told myself when I started, I was like, this is going to be my schedule and I'm going to be consistent. And, you know, by the end of the season, if this doesn't work, we'll switch gears. Mm -hmm. And, but it worked. So, so you kind of, and we went, still switched gears this year, you know, yeah. we went a different direction because we learned from it, yeah. but yeah. yeah. And it sounds like you maybe went into some of those interactions knowing that you might get a no and being okay with that and realizing that's part of the process. Like one day I'm going to get him to say yes. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, and learning and going every week and and just learning that, you know, this particular florist really likes this type of flower and this mm. other florist tends to buy this flower. So you, you learn to start because I can't take everything with me. I just couldn't fit everything. And, you know, but, and you start to learn, Hey, I know they like this or, you know, and you're starting to cut based on what they typically buy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just, Mm -hmm. or again, you're making conversations with them. You're finding out what's going on, what they might want the next week. That's what I was going to say. Like, what are you doing to get them to like you? I know that sounds like a silly question, but you've got to be relationship building here too. I mean, you're not just coming in and promoting your flowers and then leaving if they say no, right? You're having other conversations. So what else are you doing to fill in that space? Like I'm, I'm trying to like coach other people who are listening and they're like, how does this work? Like, how do you create a territory? Well, and I'll be honest people- with you. What, what, what might've worked in my favor and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. It was more of an accident, but last, last spring, my daughter, my son-in-law and my grandson, they lived out of state and they moved back home. So oftentimes they were with me. So the baby wasn't quite one yet. He's cute. Mm -hmm. You can't leave him in the car. So, you know, and that in itself was another challenge, you know, having an infant in the car, making these runs. Um, And again, you know, again, you can't leave him in the car, but you're toting him and the flowers in with you. But everybody liked to see the baby, you know? <laughs> it was That's, a good conversation piece. So. Yeah. So you you and you brought in like you brought in another a variable into the equation, right? You had something else to talk about that humanized right. you. Um mm-hmm. that, that seemed to suggest this is a woman with a story. And you were probably getting to know these people and their lives a little bit too, talking family, exactly. talking what are you doing this week, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I just think that's exactly. brilliant. Um, did you ever give them a gift of flowers just to say, Hey, just take one of these for yourself. Yeah. And that is, 
Yes, that is not uncommon at all to go in with like a sample, um, you know, or maybe you'll see them fingering like a certain variety of flower and just, you know, they're not quite, and I'm like, here, take one, stick it in a vase, see how, see how you like it. And, you know, that works. Um, anytime throughout the season, like when we have like a, a new flush of a different type of variety of flowers, it's not uncommon. I'll do like just a small mix, you know, five, 10 flowers, like one of each and just drop them by and be like, you know, Hey, here's a sample of what, what we have this week. I still do that about once a month. And, um, and again, it's let them use it, let them play with it. Yeah. You know? And when, you, you, know, when um, you think about it, you're competing, like you're trying to break into their habit, their buying habits already, because they have vendors that they've already been buying from. So it's kind of like, why do I switch? Why should I buy your stuff? Was your were you growing some of the same varieties they were already buying from someone else or were you growing things that they didn't have yet? Or was it a mix? Um, I think it was a mix. Um, for instance, but it's hard to say, like, uh, I did, it was say I was growing Snapdragon last year and one florist every year, she, every week she'd be like, they're basically the ones she was getting from the wholesale were taller they were longer and like they bring me in the cooler and they'd be like this is what I'm getting and I'm like I'm not there yet I'm trying I'm working mm. on it and um again later on in the season like I got some beauties some tall beauties and I walked in there with them and she looked at me kind of cocked her head and she was like huh and she bought them, you know, so, you know, they have a, a quality standard. And again, they're uh, florists. I mean, a lot of times they're buying, you know, the basics, the carnations, the roses, yeah. the, the baby's breath. And those are things that like, I'm not, I'm not growing. So, you know, sometimes a lot of times what you'll hear again with the whole sample thing is they'll say, I've never worked with that. So they don't know what it is. They don't know the base life. They don't know what to expect out of it. So again, that's okay to drop off a sample and say, play with it. See what you think. So, yeah. And I love that you were learning. You were able to go into their cooler and like, see what am I up against? Or what do I, what do I need to, mm -hmm. what's the bar that I need to meet or exceed? Um, yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. And so you, you persevered for an entire season. So you gave that, <laughs> how many weeks is that, that you did that for? Oh, that was May through September, early September okay. last year. And so you would mm -hmm. literally cart in your, all your flowers and bring them in to kind of show them? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Yeah. I would have the back loaded. I would either, um, they had gotten used to the fact, most all of them, they would come outside. I okay. just, you know, pop the back and it's a, you know, I have a, a, like an SUV, so you can just pop the trunk and they can look in and they could tell me what they gotcha. wanted. And, you know, most of them, they were very eager, I guess I can just say to go outside and look. And I think that's part of it is just seeing them. They want them once they see them. But mm -hmm. again, you, you can always walk in with a small sample, almost like a bouquet and say like, there's a sample of what I've got on the truck. So mm -hmm. they can know what to come out and look for. Yeah. Was there a certain day of the week that you would have to do this because that's kind of when they want the supply or are you doing this multiple times a week? Oh, I only did it on Tuesdays. Okay. I, I did runs on Tuesdays last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. This is so yeah. fascinating to me because this is not the the kind of conversation I usually have with on a <laughs> on the podcast with farmers like and I know that this is another side of you know the the especially the floral the floral business um and it's it operates in a different way and so it's kind of neat to learn what is that sales process look like and what is the even just the fulfillment process look like the ordering process what are, what are the questions that that a, this kind of a buyer has, which is different. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Uh, let's stay with this kind of customer for a moment. I'll eventually move mm -hmm. to the retail section, but, um, what are the, I guess, what do you know about this kind of a buyer, this client of yours who owns a floral business? Like, what are they, what do they care about the most? What are the quote unquote problems that you solve for them? What's going to make you rise to the top over some other supplier? I would say I might be adding more to this question than you asked me, but a, a challenge as a grower that I see working with the florist is they often honestly work with silks. Um, people request silks 
because they last longer. And it doesn't really seem to me that they use as many fresh flowers as we would assume that they use. Um, the other thing I have seen is, again, sometimes, you know, we made, I had relationships and they would show me they're and almost disgusted. They're like, this is what just came in the mail, you know, that's, or UPS or however they're getting it. And they're, I mean, it's, their shrinkage is, is crazy. They lose a lot of the flowers, you know, they're just not, they have high quality, but they also have to realize that, that there's the shrinkage because some of them just got damaged in shipping or didn't hold up well. So especially if we can get them thing that um, maybe they don't usually get the opportunity to order because they don't ship well, mm -hmm. um, or just to, you know, that's part of my marketing towards the florist is, you know, hey, these are cut these are typically less than 24 hours old when you get them in your hands. So they're fresh. So they're going to have a longer base life. And so they're paying attention probably to things like variety too. Like I want to make sure I have certain kinds of flowers in stock um, at certain mm -hmm. times of the season. Do you ever see a big influx? Are there certain weeks of the year where there's higher volume required? Um, it, it, it varies. I, I would have to say I haven't. It's slower okay. in general during the summer months. They have more work in the spring. Even, you know, we think of holidays like, you know, Mother's Day or things like that, which they obviously have, but they do, if they're doing event type doing work, events. you know, it's still typically before June or later mm -hmm. in the fall, because yeah. in the summer, um, a lot of them do say work with, um, schools or colleges, you know, doing events or different things like that. And, or even businesses and these, they have their events more in the spring and the fall. So I definitely, you know, noticed that, which is part of why we made a, a shift purposely made a shift to our crop plan to have more spring and fall flowers. Okay. All right. So you said that you shifted things, um, to a pre-order system this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And talk me through the, the why behind that decision. Okay. Well, the why, I think I touched on before. The Mondays, it was just a hard cut. You know, you're loading up, you're spending so much time grading and bunching the flowers. You don't know what's going to sell. You're not sure what they want this week. And, you know, sometimes you come back, you've sold it all. And sometimes you come back and yeah. you really didn't sell much. And it, you know, you're looking at your time versus the money there. And, you know, again, with the, the pre-order, I wanted to have say, this is what I have. This is what I have. I will cut what you want. It's going to be absolutely as fresh as I can get it. It's saving me time in the field mm -hmm. and, you know, all the processing. I don't have to spend the time going around just hoping I, I can cut to order. And yeah. that is, to me, it's just more fun it's a lot more fun. I can go out yeah. there like, Hey, I have an order for this and I can go do, 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 and just cut it. So yeah. well, and and just knowing process it's a, what I need. Knowing it's a guaranteed sale. That always feels really good. You don't, mm -hmm. nobody mm -hmm. likes wasting flowers. Today's episode is sponsored by my CSA membership Academy. You're ready to go online content source to help your CSA members thrive. Get your first month for only a dollar. When you use my coupon code trial, Visit mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash academy to get started. When you join my CSA Membership Academy, you'll gain access to six modules of my CSA Farms curated selection of member support resources, how to cheat sheets and guides, what to teach those CSA first years, cooking templates for all the basic meal formulas, my video cooking tutorials ready for you to use and implement whenever you need them, as long as your subscription in the Academy is active. Each lesson contains either a PDF guide, an infographic, a video, a cheat sheet, or a recipe collection. And as a member of the Academy, you can use them as a jumping off point to make your own educational content to help your CSA members get the most out of their season. Get your first month for only a dollar when you use the coupon code TRIAL, T-R-I-A-L. To learn more, visit mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash academy to get started. And now back to the show. So Local Line has the price list option. Do you have two different price lists then? You have a, a, a pre-order system for 
for your retail customer? Okay. Um, I do. I have a, a wholesale price list and it is set up um, by flower, the variety, the color, the stem, you know, so they can buy it by the flower. And it, it's set up that way. Whereas the retail side is just like a bouquet, like a mixed bouquet. So it's totally, totally different on that aspect. Yeah. I'm also curious, like, how are you doing the the payment feature? Are you just having it invoice only, or are you doing, um, are they, they have to pay when they order? No, I, I leave it so they can, okay. because they again, options. I'm offering it to, it's yeah. for the florist. I yeah. leave it up to them. You yeah. can pay okay. me when I get there and I can enter it. You can pay when you order, um, or I can send you an invoice. I'm really yeah. open to working with the florist on whatever works for them. Yeah. Not all e-commerce platforms offer the invoice only option. When I was researching at least years ago, that wasn't the case. It was one of the reasons I liked local line. So yes. um, let's, let's switch a little bit the conversation to your other marketing outlets. So you've got this big florist thing. Is that where you're making the majority of your income? Like, is that a greater piece of the pie or is it sort of a, is it, has it um, shifted? You know, I, I, it has shifted and I kind of, when I first started this, as far as my accounting went, I just had it broken into the cut flowers. Mm, okay. So last year that was all floor sales. Whereas this year I, I didn't think ahead of time to switch it out into the retail versus the florist sales. Mm -hmm. So it's still all lumped into cut flowers, but that's going to be a breakdown. I want, it feels to me like there's less in florist sales this year, but at the same time, I honestly think it's about even because the, the orders that are coming in amount to the same as the, yeah. if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. So, um, do you yeah. work directly? Do you ever have brides come to you and try to order flowers directly from you or, or are you just, um, saying, yeah, no? that, that's a good one. I, uh, again, going into it, I was like, I don't want to do weddings. I saw that. I will tell anybody I'm not a designer. I don't mm -hmm. pretend to be a designer. Um, and, you know, again, when you're talking about that relationship with the florist, I've told them before, especially being we've started doing more retail this year, I'm like, I don't want you to feel that I'm your competition because I'm not. I don't arrange the flowers. I don't design the flowers. You have a skill that I don't have. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as brides, I've had, we offer DIY buckets so that. they can take the flowers and arrange them themselves. I do have... Um, a uh, wedding coming up in two weeks, I believe she's picking up a couple buckets of flowers for her wedding. Um, I have had brides come to me and say like, you know, can you make me a bouquet? And I started off just being very transparent and saying, this is not what I do. I, if you want me to, I'd be happy to give it my best shot. This is probably, mm -hmm. you know, and, but I would rather refer you to one of our local designers that I know does beautiful work. Mm -hmm. And since I've done that a few times, but since then I feel that my hard line now is just gonna be like, no, we don't do that. Yeah. But here are some people to refer you to. So that the lines aren't blurred. Okay. So. so we've just spent a lot of time talking about cut flowers. I know you also sell edible flowers, dried flowers, yeah. um, native plants, um, don't you do like forestry types of things? Wood wood products? Yeah, we, yeah. yeah well, that's a big mix. Like, let's talk yeah. about you've got a lot going on. So talk about some of these other things that you sell and and are they very different clients? Yeah. So the edible flowers typically go to restaurants and bakeries. They um I have uh, one restaurant that has been a standing um client since last year. They get an order every week. And, you know, it's just one restaurant, but I'm really happy with that because that's a standing order I have every week. And then I have other restaurants that pick up stuff or the, the bakeries, if they're doing something specific, like a wedding and they want to decorate and, and do with the flowers like that. So it's very different because a restaurant is not a floor. So, you know, it's, it's a totally yeah. different vibe there. So, um, but what I like about the edible flowers in particular is that it makes a use out of a lot of the flowers. Maybe I can't use them as a cut. So, you know, maybe you've got, um, for instance, a Snapdragon, 
it's, it's crooked, it grew sideways, or maybe it's really too short for a cut, but I can still use those blooms as edibles. So edible flowers. So. Okay. And are those also then on the local line stores? You just have, are they in a different price list mm-hmm. too, just for chefs or no, no, okay. no. I, if it grew larger, I, I would need it to be that way right now. I just send them all out the same, um, on okay. the wholesale, just put them on the wholesale list. But, um, because okay. on the, because of with local line, I can add text. So again, yes. any of the flowers, that, you know, even if I'm just selling them as cuts, I can tag them as edible flowers. Right. So they can see, okay, this, maybe if they're looking for a certain color that week or, you know, a certain theme, they can search it just by the edible flowers. Got it. Got sense. it. Now, mm-hmm. what about the dried flowers? Who's your client for that? Um, the dried flowers, I won't say I so much have a client for that yet. The, well, I mean, the um, customer, it was, it was one of your products. And so I was just kind of yes. curious, is that a, is that just a thing that the public tends to see and like, oh, I want to do that. Or is there a certain kind of customer that really goes for that? One of, one of the florists did, um, has given us like a section in the front of their store um, where for the, because they don't work with dried flowers. Mm. So, but I have like, you know, dried flower wreath or dried flower, you know, different things. We did do, um, a craft show, uh, last December and we sold uh, quite a few of the dried flowers there in different things. And, you know, one of the things that actually was one of the best sellers, it was just a very tiny little vase with some dry, little dried flowers and it was really cute but the kids were buying those for their hmm. they were for their I guess for their moms or whatever moms. and you know whatever yeah 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 so I'm that. looking into more areas like that I love the dried bouquets and the, the things you can do with them I've got some things up my sleeve right now we'll be launching in a few yeah. weeks but I'm not quite there yet so <laughs> yeah okay and then talk to me about your forest products Cause that's I, something that's also been unique to you that I've, I've never interviewed someone who's doing forest products. Well, you know, like we spent all this time talking about flowers and a lot of people that they're like, Hey, she does flowers, but you know, the flowers are on a very limited part of this property. Again, most of it is forested. So it's how do we use the forest products and how are we responsible for our forest and what we have really done in the past couple of years is just really try to educate ourselves. Um, Virginia Tech has a wonderful program, um, like forestry extension program, where we can learn. And we've really gotten in. Um, we've put in trails. We have um, done what we call timber stand improvements. So just working on stuff like that, working with foresters. So where that leads for us is we use the wood chips, we use the leaf mulch, we use all that type of stuff on our farm, for instance, in the flowers, as as mulch, as row, you know, in the paths and the rows and stuff like that, just to continue to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, We have sold some of them, some of those products, but in general, we use most of them for ourselves. So, um, you know, you get other things like the firewood and different things like that, that we can sell. That's not like our push. It's one of the biggest things we do for ourselves as the farm to, because trees are a crop. They're just such a long-term crop. A lot of times people don't look at it like that, but you know, there's always the options if we get to that point of again, forest farming or there's certain flowers that grow really well more in the shaded areas. So looking to expand different patches of, of flowers in the forested areas, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, help me just, I feel like I'm still a little confused about all the different people you could possibly sell to. So you (laughs) talked about, um, the, the cut flowers and Mm -hmm. selling to florists, but do you have a pretty, I mean, do you have an email list of average Joe people that are buying your stuff. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about them. So like what's on that price list, <laughs> what are the products yeah. that they're buying and what are, how, what are you teasing them with on social media? Like, what does that, what does that look like? Okay. 
So on the retail side, um, our main product would be just a bouquet. Um, I offer those in three sizes. Again, like I said, I'm not trying to design. They're bouquets wrapped in craft paper. And, you know, that's add some cheer to your life. Um, from there, they can also the re- on the retail side, they can purchase the edible flowers, which sometimes they do. And I love that they send me pictures like um, they made a cake and they put the flowers on it. And, you know, those are the things that are really cool. Um, going on from there, uh, we have loofah. We haven't talked about the loofah. Oh, we yeah. About- so Red Handle Farm, we say flowers, field, and forest. So the field side, um, we grew field crops. Last year, we grew a, a lot of loofah. And then I was just kind of experimenting when to do that. I love loofah. Are you familiar with it? Have you used it? No, I haven't. So I feel like I'm an un- uneducated person right now. <laughs> maybe <laughs> my, maybe my audience, though, is like, get with the program, Corinna. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I grew it because I remember my great grandmother growing it. I remember her using loofah sponges. And I was like, I don't know anybody that grows loofah. I'm going to try to grow loofah. And hey, we had a, a blast with it. I use loofah, honestly, for everything. I wash the dishes with it. I wash my flower buckets with it. I use it in the shower. I mean, it's just great. You can do anything with it. And then we experimented with making, making it into soap. So that's like soap in a loofah sponge. So that was Mm. something we pushed and marketed last year through the winter seasons. And um, I got even how we got there. I'm going to be honest. But um, (laughs) okay. So I think about stuff on the website for the retail site. So there's the loofah products, right? The loofah soaps and the loofah sponges. Um, And we go into more like craft projects, like from the farm. you know, like pine cone nativities and, yeah. you know, different things like that. The dried flowers are for sale for retail. Um, and the, the dried flowers, like for crafters, or if you just want the bits to make your own wreath or flower confetti or different things like that, those are the types of things for sale on the website. Okay. So if somebody were to go to your store and get a bouquet of flowers, but also some of those other things are mm-hmm. the fulfillment side. Like, are you bringing those to those same boutiques you were talking about earlier? Like a person's just coming to pick up their entire order. It could, it could be flowers. It could be mm-hmm. other stuff too. Okay. So you have a yes. process yes. where you're packing, you like a store fulfillment process at the farm where you're packing people's orders and then you're just bringing it to these pickup sites and someone else is yes. distributing it on your behalf. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. And are most of those things available, like all year, all year long or. Except for the fresh flowers. Yeah. Right. right. Um, okay. Yeah. The other things okay. are. So again, you know, in the, on the farming side of it, you know, you have to look at, um, and I'm sure you understand this as well with your vegetable CSA and everything, but the shelf life, what do you have that will last throughout the season and get through through the winter season. So we're always kind of looking at things like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and especially you have a lot of things that I think would thrive in a gift, gift giving scenario or around Christmas or the holidays. Um, So, whereas we don't as a, as a, you know, farm that primarily grows vegetables, we're pretty much dead in December, which is when everyone else is selling a ton of stuff. (laughs) Right. Um, yeah, it's always trying to, like you said, try to figure that yeah. out. That's why. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but so yeah. let's. So are there main crop? Oh, okay, sorry. No, no, no. Keep going. You have another main crop. <laughs> another main crop. Go. <laughs> another another main crop. How many main crops can you have? But we're on the looking at the five year plan. I guess you should say is we are um, growing blueberries. We have a substantial yes. amount of blueberries growing right now. Um, to come at like really full production, you're looking at about five years. So we have some that are probably four years old right now. We planted a lot more this year. So again, being that I've learned that the flowers don't sell as well in the heat of the summer, but that's when the blueberries come in. So again, you're looking at, Mm. you know, continue keeping your cash flow rolling. Yeah, that's actually really smart. Um, and I just want everyone who's listening right now to to notice that it, sometimes we're creating products for the windows of time when we need when we yeah. need a, a cash influx. And 
Um, that's not something that maybe you see right away when you start your business, but as you go through a few seasons, you begin to experience the cash flow issue and you're always trying to find like where are the where can I create peaks um in my promotion yeah. calendar? Yeah. Okay. So that hasn't really has that are you actually selling blueberries yet? You said you're on year four. I mean, have you started to sell that product? This is the first year that we're gonna have uh, quantities large enough to sell. And what we did was um, with the emails, I, I'd say a teaser, you know, you say coming mm -hmm. soon, they yeah. posted, you know, or they like, then, you know, maybe in the last few weeks, you know, it was like, hey, these are going to be available. If you want to be like on a pre-order list, you want to know when they, they are in, let us know. So we've actually already started a pre-order list for these. So mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. We've been eating on them the last week or so, but yeah, we should have some available to sell in the next next yeah. couple of weeks. Okay, well let's let's talk a little. You've mentioned email list. Um, I know you have social media, so like let's talk a little bit about the the um, the sales funnel, if that's the right word for this kind of scenario for some of the people mm -hmm. who are on your retail side. Um, how are I guess, first of all, how are people finding out that you even exist? Um, two things, I guess, you know, organically, word of mouth. You, you yeah. know, you, it's just like I'm with the floor side. You have to get out. You have to talk to people. It is in the marketing world. I don't know if, if you're used to that, but I was always told, don't give your stuff away because it makes it less valuable. People won't value it as much if you're just giving it away. But I find that like if I'm going out and I am free with my flowers and I don't mean just giving them all away, but you know, I can give away a bunch a week somewhere. And then that's people take pictures of them. They share them on social media. They are talking about, Hey, did you know she's doing this? And mm -hmm. you know, it, it goes like that. So um, we get a lot of referrals, I guess you'd say that way or clients. Um, the other way, uh, we started just with Instagram and actually I, I know you did a podcast very similar to this whole, like, where is your market? And, you know, your local market isn't necessarily on Instagram or with other farmers. And um, I'll be the first to tell you, I was very hesitant to do the Facebook thing. I really avoided it, but a lot of our traffic was coming from where other people posted on Facebook. You know, again, here's the flowers or, you know, look at these. So we finally got the Facebook page up. And um, according to the, the stats that come in from the website, the majority of the traffic comes from Facebook this year. Mm, interesting. Um, so that's kind of your top of funnel. You're posting things in those locations. People are hearing about it from their friends. And I do want to point out when you give away flowers and you position it as a gift to someone, um, first of all, flowers mm -hmm. is something that is very easy to give. Like it's, yeah. it would be a little bit more, I mean, I can also give away vegetables, <laughs> but like flowers usually are gifts. You know, we either yeah. give, gift yeah. them to ourselves or we buy them to give to someone. So for you to walk up to be someone to someone and be like, I have a bouquet to give you, like, this is not a foreign concept. Right. So, um, but it also, I think activates the rule of reciprocity, which is one of the, one of the actually psychology of sales triggers. I don't know if you know that, <laughs> um, but when you, when you leverage the rule of reciprocity, where you like give something in advance and now they're like, wow, that's so awesome. And there's this sense of like, I want to do something nice back. Right. When, and we're not necessarily manipulating people that way, but that's probably working in your favor as well. When a person receives a gift, they're like, wow, this is great. And I, I want either want this again, or I want to do, but do right by them and, and support them. True. Um, yeah. So, okay. So that's how people find out about you. You did mention you have an email list. So how are you getting people onto the email list? Is that just happening because they buy from local line and now they're on your email list or are you actively trying to get them on there somehow? No, that's typically how they get on there now, you know, as with any email marketing, start where you're at. I mean, when yeah. I, I started again, it goes back to that consistency and we started, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to do an email, not weekly. I do it monthly, but I mean, 
I started with like six people <laughs> and then like, I'm like, and, you know, I'll look back, you know, who did I text this week? Who did I email with this week? You know, can I add you to the list? And just, and then, you know, as you get customers or um, even if they're not, you know, we have a lot of maybe request people that fill out the, on the website, like send me more information or, you know, they have a question and then we put them into the funnel that way. Right. Right. Um, are you using the feature on local line where it just, you turn, you check mark a little box and they just automatically send an email to anyone who's on your list and say, here's what's in the store this week. Or are you sending the email from your own email service provider every month you go into? Okay. Well, that's a double question. So for the florist, yes, I use the local line okay. automatic feature. I have it set up. It goes mm -hmm. out the same day every week. Here it is. Here's the Got list. It. And again, same time, that consistency. Mm -hmm. um, as for the retail side, no, I send that email. Um, I use the where my web hosting is. So I okay. send it out through that. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, so I love that you are consistently making offers to customers who've already bought, right? Those are the people that are already warm. They're hot. They're ready to buy again in many cases. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes I know this was me when I first started, like that didn't occur to me that I should continue to cultivate the people I already have. I was always focused on getting more people in who are, mm -hmm. you know, new customers instead of spending time on the ones that I had already. And when I made that switch to spend more of my time talking to the people I already have and still time on new people, but like, um, yeah, sure that yeah. I made new, those, those recurring customers aware of what I, what I have and trying to create buying habits. That's where I started to really see progress. Um, how are you marketing, which I think you do pretty well on your website with that, but like, as you're trying to decide what to post, what to talk about today or this week, what's my promo this month? Um, what am I going to put on my email? What am I going to put on my website? Like talk a little bit about how you make those decisions. Well, again, okay, let's split this up into like the wholesale side versus the retail side. Mm -hmm. So on local, on the, on the wholesale side, you can like your price list that goes out every week, you can yeah. drag and drop whatever you want them to see first to the top. Yeah. So for instance, it's if I have an abundance of a certain type of flower this week, that's going to be the first one they see mm -hmm. versus, you know, and I can switch it in that, Smart. that way they're not op opening up the email each week and see the first, even if they don't the scroll and they just see the first thing, they see something different. So I would say that's one way to do it. Um, on the retail side, I try to keep that, again, that relational piece. So the email that comes out will always have some sort of personal blurb for me, a personal story, a memory, something. I thank you for, this is important to me that I'm that we're working together. And then it will go into um, things like coming soon. You know, again, you're talking about the blueberries, you know, something new is in the works to look for this, or this is what we have this week, or, you know, it, yeah. and I also put in, and it goes back kind of to the coaching thing. We always used to talk about highs and lows, you know, people, a lot of times are pessimistic. We think about what went wrong, what's going bad, but what are the good things that happen? So sometimes I'll have the highs and the lows because in marketing, I think we want people to think, Hey, everything's always great. And we're PG, but sometimes things really suck and they go bad. And I try not to be ashamed to put the lows in there or something really funny. You know, mm -hmm. there's a funny story that happened at the farm this week. Yeah. Is and this, I'm curious when you send this email, I'm trying to imagine like formatting wise, what it looks like, like, does it, does it have like different blocks? So you have your, at the top, <laughs> yes. kind of have the story. And then there's like a headline that says what's in the store this week. And then, then there's highs and lows or like, is that kind of how you have it? Yeah. So they can, yeah. Okay. Okay. Pretty much. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how Might I do be a it too. Section so. mm -hmm. saying like what's blooming this, you know, or different things like that. Yeah. Right. Got it. Okay. Uh, you've mentioned local line several times today. <laughs> uh, I want you to just talk a little bit about why you decided, were you looking at other platforms? Um, why did you decide to choose them or what made you decide you needed to go that route in the first place? Well, I guess you'd say as with anything, there's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving yeah. pieces and a lot of things you learn along the way. But 
again, last year, I really wanted to figure out how to push this pre-ordering thing. Um, I tried other uh, platforms and I just, I couldn't get the force to use them. I couldn't get retail. It was just like, I don't know, not user-friendly. I tried using the ones like in my um, website platform. I've tried using like Square has its own platform and like, they're just clunky or they didn't have the the features that I was looking for and different things like that. And I, the first time I heard about them may have honestly been on your podcast. I'm not sure, but I did end up getting the Ready Farmer one book over the winter. I wanted to read that over the winter. And probably the biggest thing that really hit me in that book was about it's we're in a digital age. Everything you want to buy is a click of a button away, except for your farm stuff. Farmers, that's just, we right. farmers markets, you know what I mean? And I was like, you know, that's right. And I explored them and I was like, you know, they really looks like they have what I want. And then the more I learned about it, the more impressed I was. Again, you've got the different price list. You can send the, e the price list inventory availability out directly. You can do anything from taking credit cards to entering your cash to doing an invoice. And there was just so much in there. And then what really floored me was when I signed up and they, they did like the one-on-one -on -one call, they onboarded me. They're like, Hey, we'll even put upload all the products for you. If you want, you've got a one to one support system the whole way through. Like I can, you're not calling in and sitting on hold forever. If you have a question, you have a person, you get to know your person, your customer service person. And I told them in the beginning, I was like, if this is anywhere near what it feels like it's going to be, I was like, I will be your biggest supporter. And when I, I've been to a couple of different like farm tours this year where you meet with other growers and I haven't hesitated to tell anybody. I'm like, I love this system. It is so easy to use. And then like, as far as inventory, I can go out in the field with my phone and just walk around and update my inventory. I and I don't have to, you're not at the desk. It's just yeah. so easy to use. And then orders. I mean, we were out in the field yesterday and then my phone's just like ding and it's like, you have an order. And I'm like, oh, look, I can start cutting this right now. You know, <laughs> it's so convenient. Can you just maybe talk a little bit more about their onboarding process? Because I think that some farmers might be interested in knowing what happens after you say, I want to try this. Uh, what are some of the different milestones that that happen before they sort of release you and say, okay, you, you can go? I, let's see, I started it last year. If I remember, you could get like a free trial, like maybe for a week to get in and play around with it and everything. But I got an email, like right, I might have phone calls. It's amazing me. They, they pick up the phone and will just call me. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, is everything okay? Can we help you with anything? And I'm like, Hey, this is cool. You know? And, um, but honestly, I got a video introduction. And she was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to be your representative. I'm going to work with you. And I was like, she called me by name. You could tell it wasn't a canned video. And I was like, huh, again, relationship. I was like, that's pretty cool. We scheduled a, uh, a Zoom call. She kind of walked me through everything so I could see it. She could, you know, I could ask questions as we went. She was willing to meet with me, like, do you want to meet again next week? Like, until I was comfortable with it. And like I said, anywhere since then, if I've even remotely had a question, I just can email them. Somebody always gets right back to me and answers the question. It's so customizable. There are so many ways to click this button or change this box so that it does what you want it to do that I occasionally I've gotten to a sticking point where I'm like, I can't figure out what I'm not, you know, I've mm -hmm. turned on or off. That's like preventing something to happen. And they're like, Oh, you didn't do this. And I'm like, got it. You know, right. but it's, right. but the right. customization is really nice. Yeah. I think you said something important earlier too, about that for the customer, the platform is 
preferable, right? And I've heard that from people as well, that sometimes the struggle, like you maybe set up the system for your chefs or whoever, but then they don't use it uh, because they can't figure it out or it's just not convenient. And that's not the case with this, which is one one of the things I love. And that's not talked about enough, but. All right. Well, we'll stop crushing on local line. Not, this is not a podcast about local line, but I just was kind of curious what your thoughts were on it. So I just have a few more. We're kind of coming to the end here. I want to wrap this up. All these outlets that you have right now, marketing outlets, is there one that you're most excited about or one that you really want to grow? You know, that's kind of a trick question. Or are, I guess where I'm at, what I'm asking is like, are you content with where you are? Because I sometimes I feel like farms feel like they constantly have to keep growing and growing and growing. Are you sort of like, no, man, I'm, I'm, no, I, I do not feel that. Okay. <laughs> I don't feel that. I am I'm happy. Our growth, we sold more this year by the end of May than I sold all of last year. Hmm. So I mean, if the growth keeps up like that, what's there to complain about? Yeah. And there's not but so much I can do, you know, without hiring and getting big. And what do you, what do you, I think that's a very common problem, bigger, bigger, better, but what Mm. happens It's more stress and more pressure and more of this, and maybe your quality goes down. And I'm really kind of happy. I get a looking at the the five-year plan, the long-term plan, you know, I want to be able to have stuff consistently. People get used to what I have, you know, I'm always adding more, but not to a crazy extent, if that makes sense. So, you know, like we added some peonies, we've added some dahlias this year, we've added some more blueberries, but that's just to keep, you know, with farming, you're looking at weather, you're looking at pests, you're looking at whatever. And, you know, that's that's the old adage, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. You mentioned that you, you, well, you kind of brought up the topic of team. Are you the team or do you have anybody else that you hire? (laughs) I'm the main team. Now, as far as the flowers and all that goes, um, I have two adult children. My son is what I call the assistant farm manager. He does the hard, heavy stuff around here. He does the maintenance. He does the logging. He does the bush hogging. You know, the the fix it. He fixes if it's broken. But as far as the flowers. You know, I, I plant the seeds, I transplant, I'm doing the bouquets, you know, I'm doing all of that. I'm doing the harvesting. Um, most all that comes to me. I'm doing the emails, I'm doing the local line orders. So again, yeah. anything I can do to make it easier is better. Yeah. Um, my daughter does most all of the social media side of it because um, I think it's an age thing. I don't care that much about it, but it's, it's the truth of what it is. You know, it's a way you have to be. So she does most all of our posts. Um, I occasionally, I do a lot of the stories on Instagram because that's easy for me. Um, That's where you're going to see my side. And my son did say something the other day. He said, I can always tell when mom did a post because they're snappy. (laughs) I tend to make the longer ones from my heart, you know? um... (laughs) Um, I love that. It's such an interesting question. I like to ask that of of farmers to try and get an idea of like, Hey, is your, is your goal to just keep growing and getting bigger and bigger? Or is there a point where you're satisfied? And, you know, Mm -hmm. I I don't know if there's a right answer to that. I don't think there is, but it's an interesting question to ponder as a business owner. Like, what are you chasing after? And when is enough enough? Um, My goal is to get better. I want to get better at what Mm -hmm. I do, not necessarily bigger. Yeah. Do you feel like your quality of life is good in terms of the number of hours you have given? It to the can farm? get hectic. Um, again, that depends. I mentioned my grandson earlier. I keep him a fair bit of the time. So depends on if it's a week where I have him a lot. Yeah. He's a very active toddler right now. So I can have like, you know, if you've got him a couple of days in a row full time, then yes, it's like I'm up so early in the morning. I'm running as hard and fast as I can before he gets here. And I'm running as hard as and fast as I can after he leaves until it gets dark. But in general, and that's still okay. The farm is like the best school ever, you know? Yeah. yeah. You realize everything you learn in here. So yeah. You know. Yeah, I think we have a good family balance. 
All right. So what, if you had to give some advice to farmers who are listening, what's been your biggest ROI or big aha moments, you know, if we wanted to help farmers who only have a few hours a week to be focusing on sales and marketing, like what should they be spending their time on? Or what are those really important lessons that you've learned along the way that, that you wish you'd known sooner? Hey, I'm going to go back to that consistency thing. And don't think, look at it as a season or look at it as spring, summer, fall, however you want to look at it and say, I'm going to do X consistently for the next month, three months, whatever it is, and then go back and evaluate how that worked for you and how you want to tweak it. And that goes back into like my coaching world. You have to start somewhere, but you have to be consistent to figure out what to do next. And then as far as the next part on <laughs> what was the other half of that question? Well, it was, it was like, if you, if you only had a certain number of hours to spend a week there you on go. marketing, yeah, that was the other. And part. then wrapping back around to, and if they haven't listened to it, you did another a good podcast on that a while back on Instagram, Facebook, and where you're, people are, but dig into your data a little bit and figure out where your local audience is. If that's who you're marketing to is local and then figure out, spend your social media time or your email marketing time to those local people. Good tips. Well, this has been awesome. Where can people check you out online and learn more about your farm? (laughs) We are at Red Handle Farm. So the website's redhandlefarm.com. The Instagram and the Facebook is Red Handle Farm. Awesome. And I recommend you guys go and just check out the, the store on Local Line because I think you'll get a good idea of some of the different things that she sells. And maybe you'll get some ideas for even just for products you could sell by looking at uh, some of the neat craft ideas and the especially in your wood products. I, I liked looking at that. It's like thinking about, oh, that's, that's neat. I'd buy that. (laughs) (laughs) We should all be scoping out one another's stores just for like ideas for how to name our products, how to bundle them and just product ideas in general, right? We should, I wish there were an easier way for us to all like, yeah, talk to one another and learn from each other. This has been so, so great, Bridget. Thank you for giving me this time and sharing your wisdom with our audience. Um, any final words that you want to share before we go? I just want to say thank you. You know, when you first reached out to me, I was like, yeah, I'm just a little fish in a big sea. What do I have to tell her? And then I realized how much I listen to other farmers and their honesty and their, just their vulnerability to share. I've learned so many tidbits from them. So if, if I've said anything that can help somebody else, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for your time. Thanks again for joining me, Bridget. It was awesome meeting you. Have a wonderful season. How are you too? Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. I always get so much out of conversations with farmers. And I'm going to make sure that I put her information into the show notes, which you can find at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 220. Now, if you liked today's episode, or if you just had your mind blown by something that was said today, would you please go leave me a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts? Or even better, go tell someone that you know who needs to listen to this message today. Just share the link of the podcast with them so that they can hear it. That would be so great. I'm just trying to make as many people as possible know about this podcast resource Don't forget, if you want to get onto my email list, I have some free stuff to send your way that's going to help your marketing get even better. Go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. And I have a Facebook group. It's called the CSA Marketing Discussion Group. If you're a CSA farmer and you want to connect with other CSA farmers and ask questions about marketing or share ideas, things that are working for you, that's a great place to go and get connected. So just do a search in Facebook groups for CSA Marketing discussion. I'm also on Instagram at my digital farmer. I show up there almost every day with an Instagram story. I love connecting with people there. And if you know someone who would be a great podcast guest, or if you want to come onto the show, maybe you've only been doing business for a year or two. That's okay. Like 
we just had a guest today who's only been doing this for a year and we learned so much from her, right? So I would be happy to uh, talk with you and see if we'd be a match. Reach out to me over email. You can reach me at Corinna at mydigitalfarmer.com. That's C-O-R-I-N-N-A. I'd love to chat with you. Have a wonderful week, everyone. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.